Hey there and welcome to RimWorld. My name is Pete and yes, we are starting a brand new series and we complete RimWorld Beta 18. Now, RimWorld is a sci-fi colony builder game that is still in early access. However, for over a month now, the game is officially out of alpha. And with Beta 18 released, I think this is a perfect time to start a full completionist series. And as the title and description already reveal, we will be playing one hell of a tough scenario. Tribal start, one colonist, no equipment, ice sheet, randy random, extreme difficulty. I think it's safe to say that we're in for quite the challenge. Now, quick note at this point, the setup for this playthrough will be rather detailed. We will actually spend the next 10 minutes or so configuring our scenario, our world and our character. And I will explain a lot of stuff that might be old news to those of you who are already familiar with the game. Nonetheless, around the 5 minute mark or so, when we're choosing where to settle, things will already get pretty strategic. So even if you already know a lot of these things, maybe you're still interested to see how I approach this scenario. I will leave several timestamps down below in the description and in the comments, so you can choose and go straight to the part of the video that interests you the most. Now, maybe for those of you who are new, this right here is a completionist channel, meaning that we usually play games to full completion. This can include, for example, the entire storyline of a game, so all main and side quests, or unlocking all available achievements if the game has them. Now, for those of you who are a bit more familiar with RimWorld, you know that the game doesn't really have quests or achievements. Nonetheless, the game does have an end, and that is also the overall goal of this playthrough, to finish the game and reach that end. And I think I will explain everything else as we go along, so let's get things started with a new colony. Now, by default, RimWorld offers three different scenarios, and the three main variables between those scenarios are the number of people you start with, the amount and quality of equipment that you start with, and your level of research. The crash-landed scenario is more or less the standard. It has you start with three colonists, a good amount of equipment, and a rather modern level of research and technology. The Rich Explorer scenario then is a variation of that, allowing you to start with only one colonist instead of three, but in exchange giving you better equipment and a slightly higher level of research as well. The Tribal Start, on the other hand, creates its challenge pretty much the other way around, by giving you more colonists to start with, five this time, but instead giving them low-level equipment and a significantly reduced level of research, leaving them technologically far behind the crash-landed scenario. That lack of technology and the slow research rate is also the main source of challenge for this scenario, but I think for our playthrough we can increase that even further. In our playthrough we will take the tribal start as a base, but instead of 5 tribal colonists we will start with only one. To add to the challenge we will also give that colonist no equipment whatsoever, so we will start with absolutely nothing, which means we have to get every resource we need from the map that we play on. The research level will of course remain tribal, so we will start with a lot of things not researched yet. For example, we will start things off with no electricity, as well as, and this is new in beta 18, without beds. One last thing, I have disabled the Wanderer Joints incident, which is an event that can randomly happen in the game that gives you an additional colonist pretty much for free. On one hand, those additional colonists can make the game a lot easier, on the other hand, it removes all control you have over who joins your colony and who doesn't. So, this is our setup, let's choose the Storyteller next. Once again, RimWorld gives you three options here, Cassandra Classic, Phoebe Chillax and Randy Random. Cassandra Classic is the default Storyteller, offering a steadily increasing challenge as the colony grows. Phoebe Chillax, as the name already suggests, is a bit more relaxed, giving you a bit more time between random events, while still remaining somewhat challenging in the later stages of the game. And then we have Randy Random. Randy Random doesn't really care about breaks between events. He also doesn't really care about steadily increasing the challenge. He will just randomly throw events at you, both good and bad, sometimes with a lot of time in between, other times multiple events at once. That makes him by far the most unpredictable storyteller, and one could argue that he's also the hardest one. However, at least in my opinion, his unpredictability also makes him the most entertaining storyteller. And because Randy Random seems to perfectly combine entertainment and challenge, he will be the storyteller for this playthrough. Now we can also select the difficulty, and these will always be the same, no matter who your storyteller is. And they are pretty straightforward, peaceful is the easiest one, and extreme is the hardest one. And of course, we want to go for the toughest possible challenge, and for that reason we will select Randy Random on Extreme Difficulty. Up next, we have to create our world, and worlds in RimWorld are generated randomly based on a seed. For some of you, that might be familiar from a little game called Minecraft. The good thing is that based on the seed and the other settings here, the worlds that are generated will always be the same. So that means, if you want to, with the seed Pete, you can play along. We will then set globe coverage to 100%, even though world generation will take a while with that setting, while the rainfall and temperature settings will remain at normal levels. 
Now I have set world coverage to 100% as this is the only setting that will generate an entire planet. And because I have a very specific biome and environment in mind that we want to play on, we want to have a full planet generated as that gives us the highest chance of actually finding what we need. Alright, this right here is our world and as you can see we have different biomes. In the middle, near the equator, we have a lot of shrubland, desert and rainforest. And as we move further away from that, we will see temperate forest, boreal forest, tundra and eventually ice. Now, ice comes in two different variations in this game, ice sheet and sea ice. Sea ice is very likely the hardest biome to survive on in this game. So hard in fact that it is absolutely impossible with the scenario that we have chosen. So we will just take the next best thing and that is Ice Sheet. Compared to the absolutely flat sea ice, Ice Sheet gives you the occasional hill or mountain and we might even meet the occasional animal. And at this point, choosing our starting location, we will already get a bit strategic. Now what I want here is a tile that has a mountainous terrain as that will hopefully increase our chances to build a defensible base and it will also provide us with a healthy amount of stones and minerals. Speaking of which, stone types are the next thing that we want to look out for. And so we want to find a mountainous tile that has granite, marble and sandstone. Now there are other stones in this game like limestone or slate, but granite, marble and sandstone all possess unique qualities that make them a bit more desirable than the rest. Now granite is the hardest stone in the game, making it also the most durable, so it is the best type of stone to build outer walls and frontline defenses with. Marble, on the other hand, is regarded as the most beautiful stone in the game, so everything built from marble will impress your colonists just a tiny bit more. Sandstone, then, is the type of stone that is quickest to work with, making it not only faster to mine than the other stones, but also very useful if you want to build structures very, very quickly. Now, I did find a good place right here at 86.06 degrees north and 171.91 degrees east, so once again, if you want to play along, that is the tile we're going to play on. And as you can see here on the left, it has mountainous terrain with sandstone, granite and marble. Now one last thing that is also somewhat important when selecting a site here is temperature. Of course, on the ice sheet it will be pretty cold most of the time. And we actually want that, we want it to be cold enough. And cold enough, in my experience, is achieved when the average summer temperature is below minus 10 degrees Celsius. The reason for that is that I never ever want to have temperatures above zero. As long as we have zero degrees or below, food, meat and corpses will remain frozen. And as long as they're frozen, they won't rot, allowing us to store them pretty much indefinitely. And that is actually one of the few advantages the ice sheet offers. So with a quick look at temperature here, we want to make sure that we absolutely get the most out of it. Now also a quick look at the advanced settings here, where we will slightly increase the map size from 250x250 250 250 to 275x275, 275 275, simply because large parts of the map will be mountain, and a slight increase here gives you just a tiny bit more useful terrain to work with. We will also set the starting season to summer, where we will have the warmest temperatures, otherwise this playthrough might become very short-lived, as starting in winter could have a colonist freeze to death in just a few minutes. One last thing that we want to at least keep in mind are the factions here, where we have three friendlies and two hostiles, and the yellow faction here, the Blue Rock Nation tribe, those are actually friendly, which is somewhat convenient because they are the faction that is closest by. But we'll get more into factions as we go along. For now, let's complete the last step of our preparations and meet our colonist. Now, RimWorld normally generates your colonists at random, but it does give you the option to reroll as many times as you like with the randomize button. Now we could do that until we find a suitable colonist, but that might take quite a while because surprise surprise I once again have a very specific character in mind. For that reason and just as a matter of convenience I have installed the prepare carefully mod. That is however the only mod featured in this playthrough, the gameplay itself will be entirely vanilla and mod free. The prepare carefully mod is simply installed so that I don't have to click randomize for 15 minutes straight. You can however do exactly that, but there are a few things that I absolutely want my colonists to have here. Number one, most importantly and absolutely critical for this playthrough is the cannibal trait. Without this ability to eat human flesh relatively penalty free, this playthrough will be more or less impossible. Now the rest is not as important, but having an adult, so a guy that is at least 20 years old also helps tremendously, as it not only gives you the childhood but also the adulthood backstory, which provides you with bonuses to various skills. Speaking of backstories and skills, ideally your pawn is incapable of nothing. There are backstories that make a colonist for example incapable of violence. However, since we play with only one colonist, we want him, at least in theory, to be able to do anything. Now, I allowed myself to uh, optimize slightly here. I think the odds are already heavily stacked against us and therefore a bit of tweaking should be allowed. And I went with the cave child and digger backstories, both giving bonuses to construction and mining. 
and those skills, especially mining, will be very important on the mountainous map that we play on. I also took the liberty and added two more very useful traits, but like I said, apart from Cannibal, those are definitely not a requirement. The Industrious trait significantly increases our pawn's work speed, while the Jogger trait makes him move faster. So Cambia here will be able to do everything just a tiny bit faster, which, considering the overall circumstances that we're facing, is a small advantage that we can allow ourselves to have. Now the last thing on the right side here are the skills. Now Cambiar has knowing capabilities, so technically he can do everything. That however does not mean that he's good at everything. I have put a few points in shooting in melee because he needs to be able to defend himself, and since we will go for ranged weapons as early as possible, I have given him one flame of passion for the shooting skill, meaning that he will learn that skill at an increased rate. Social and animals remain at zero because they're not overly important, at least not compared to the other skills, while medicine on the other hand is somewhat important and therefore gets 5 points and 1 flame of passion. Cooking gets only 2 points because we won't cook for quite a while, but once we do we want to have some familiarity, while construction and mining will be Cambia's main skills, resulting of course from his backstories. For storytelling purposes, they are also the only two skills I allow him to have burning passion in, so 2 flames, which I think makes sense considering his backstories. Growing will not be a heavy focus for a long time and therefore remains at zero. Art is also largely irrelevant in the early game, whereas crafting and more importantly intellectual will see a lot more use. Both get a flame and intellectual is actually our highest rated skill, because we will be forced to research some technologies very very early on, and intellectual is the skill that helps with that. All in all, our colonist is now worth roughly 1800 points, which is par for the course for some of the better randomly generated colonists, so Cambiar is by no means overpowered, he is just extremely carefully created. Now if you want to play along but don't have them out, then please don't overthink it. The only real requirement for this playthrough is the cannibal trait, and then having no injuries or incapabilities would be desirable as well, but your skill set can look different from this, and that might make your playthrough a bit harder, however it won't make it entirely impossible. Now, we have finally reached a point where we are about to jump in. I admit the preparation took a bit longer than I had anticipated, but as the saying goes, failing to plan is planning to fail. And with that, let's go planet side and play some Rimworld. Alright, here we are, Cambiar in the middle of nowhere. Quick look at the map, and as expected we have quite a few hills and mountains scattered around, including one huge mountain that covers the entire southern edge of the map. Now at this point in the game we have two things that are of critical priority. Number one, getting food, and number two, not freezing to death. And with food we really only have one choice. As you can see there are no edible plants anywhere around here and there never will be, so instead we need to look for animals to hunt. And luckily there are a few snow hares on the map, which will hopefully be enough to get us through the first two or three days. Very important with the snow hares, however, is that they won't stay on the map forever. Sooner or later they will discover that there is no food for them here, and at that point they will begin to wander off. Now we also have a polar bear here that we definitely do not want to mess with, and when this guy starts to get hungry he will not simply wander off, instead he will start hunting. Snow hares, if there are still some available, but if that's not the case, he will come after us. That is not an immediate danger, but something we definitely want to keep in mind. Now the second big problem at the moment is temperature. As you can see here in the lower right corner, we currently have an outer temperature of minus 21 degrees Celsius. Now it is still only 6 o'clock in the morning, so that temperature will rise a bit during the day, but it will remain uncomfortably cold. Now if we have a look at Cambiar here and open up his information window, then we can see both his maximum and minimum comfortable temperature. And that minimum comfortable temperature is at 2 degrees. That means everything below will make Cambiar feel cold and give him a penalty to his mood, and everything significantly below that will cause him to freeze, eventually develop hypothermia, which can ultimately lead to death. Now we can of course take measures to protect Cambiar from the elements, and one of the easiest ways to do that is with clothing. In the gear tab we can see what Cambiar has currently equipped, and that would be a piece of cloth tribal wear. And that cloth tribal wear has a cold insulation of a minus 10 degrees, meaning that it increases Cambia's tolerance for cold temperatures by those 10 degrees. That gear however is already factored into his overall minimum comfortable temperature, so without the tribal wear that would be even higher at 12 degrees. Now at this point in the game we can't really do much about this, we have no materials or other means of crafting new and warmer equipment, so we have to resort to the only other viable option of staying warm on the ice sheet, steam geysers. There are a few dotted around the map that will at regular intervals give off hot air, and normally that hot air evaporates into the cold air around them. 
However, it is possible to build structures around these geysers, which will allow us to trap the heat. And that is what we will have to do in order to not freeze to death on this map here. So our first two tasks for this episode are number one, hunt a snow hare, and number two, build a shelter around the steam geyser. Now for that second part, we also want to have a quick look at which geyser we're going to use. Eventually, I want to build a mountain base because we don't really have the resources to build one in the open, and a mountain base also has numerous other advantages that we will get into in due time. So ideally, we're looking for a geyser close to that big mountain in the south here. There are two close to the western edge of the map, and then we have two more here on the other side, but I think we'll go with this one here in the west, because as you can see here, it is in a very secluded area, which should also be a bit easier to defend. On top of that, and this is really the most important reason, there's also steel close by, and steel will be our only building material in the beginning, so having it just a few tiles from where we want to build is very useful. But I would say let's get to it now, we need to start hunting, and for that purpose we will draft Cambiar, and then we'll tell him to melee attack the snow hare that is closest by. And he will then do that with his fists because we don't have a weapon yet, so it might take a while for the snow hare to go down. Okay, so the snow hare has attacked back. This is something that can happen and is not overly dangerous unless the wounds get infected. Now we can see in Cambia's health tab that he has suffered three snow hare bites, and of course we want him to bandage those immediately. For that purpose, we will activate the self tent option on the left here, and we will set it to doctor care but no medicine, simply because we don't have medicine anyway. Cambia will now tend to his wounds and bandage him up, which will stop the bleeding and start the healing process. While the wounds are healing, there is a small risk of them getting infected though, and if that happens, we might have a bit of a problem on our hands early on, so all we can do here is hope that Cambia will be fine. Alright, Cambia is fully patched up, and because he's not hungry at the moment, we don't need to eat the snow hare just yet. Instead, we want to haul it back to where we will eventually build our base. For that purpose, we will simply create a small stockpile down here, and we will set that to allow everything. Cambia will then haul the snow hair down there, and he can eat it later once he's finished building. And now it is high time that we start building a shelter. And with the planning tool here, I have outlined the walls. We don't have to fill in the corners, and the room will still count as closed off, so that allows us to save some materials. In total, we therefore need 18 pieces of wall, minus one because one of them is going to be a door, and to build all of that, we need at least 110 steel. So let's tell Cambiar to mine four blocks of steel here. Each block mined will give us slightly over 30 steel, so four blocks will be enough to build what we have planned. Alright, everything is mined, we should now have more than 120 steel to work with, so let's start building. The door will be placed near the top left corner, as that is also the direction in which Cambia leaves and enters the area, so with the door at the top there, he won't have to run around the entire building to enter on the other side. Now we can also see here that sometimes construction fails. This can happen if your colonist has a low construction skill. In our case though, it is the result of Cambia's injuries. Whenever a construction fails, some of the resources will be wasted, so it's a good thing that we have mined a few extra. Okay, here we are, late afternoon already, and Cambiar is actually using the last steel block to finish the building here, as his construction attempts failed quite a few more times throughout the building process. Now the construction is finished though, and Cambia will proceed to build a roof. Building a roof does not cost any resources, and materials stored under a roof will never deteriorate. In our case, the roof also serves a vital function in trapping the heat from the steam geyser, and we will be able to see that effect in just a few moments. Okay, now the roof is finished, the steam geyser is blowing out hot steam, and we can already see the indoors temperature rising. As a comparison, outside we currently have minus 6 degrees, inside however we have a cozy 27. Now all the building has made Cambia pretty hungry. He is already urgently hungry, giving him a minus 14 mood penalty, so let's have him eat the snow hair now. Now consuming a raw corpse is definitely not fine cuisine, but for the early game it will have to do.
Cambiar has consumed the corpse in one go, leaving us now without any food reserves. So while we still have a few hours before Cambiar needs to go to sleep, let's find ourselves a few more snow hares to hunt. As Cambiar makes himself on his way, we can now see that he is fully healed from his earlier injuries, so like I said, unless the wounds get infected, a few scratches won't hurt us too much. Now this snow hare conveniently does not fight back, allowing us to kill it without taking damage. And since we still have a bit of time, let's immediately go for another one. In our home base, we will then create a bigger stockpile right next to the wall here, delete the other one and tell Cambiar to start hauling. We will also quickly set his entire schedule to anything, so that Cambiar does not go to sleep simply because it's time to, but only when he's tired enough and actually needs some sleep. Now we're hauling both snow hares back to the base at the same time. Cambiar though can only carry one, so we'll have to go back and forth. Now Cambiar is also slowly getting pretty damn cold, as he has already developed serious hypothermia. Now he can probably stay out for a few more moments, but we want to get him inside as quickly as possible. Speaking of inside, we will now also place a sleeping spot inside of our shelter. This is by no means a bed, it simply shows Cambia where he's supposed to sleep. Then just seconds before he can get inside, Cambia develops frostbite, so once again he needs to tend to himself now, otherwise we actually risk losing a finger here. And with the wound tended now, Cambiar can finally get some sleep. Three hours later, the injury has already fully healed again, and a further three hours later, Cambia needs to get back up because he is once again getting hungry. Now the next goal is to build a few more things inside of our shelter. For that, we quickly need to move the sleeping spot, and then with the planning tool, I have once again outlined the area that we're going to use. And we want to build four different things here. A research bench, a table, a stool and a crafting spot. In that crafting spot we also want to craft a club later on and the material costs for all of those things will be 183 steel. And with every block giving us slightly more than 30 steel we now need to mine 6 blocks. Okay, we have a first random event, a group of visitors, and they apparently have something to trade. Now, we don't have silver or anything else to trade them in exchange, but it might still be worth having a look at their inventory. The visitors are still on their way and Cambiar has already mined what he needed to, so he can quickly get some rest until the group arrives. Okay, they're here, let's have a look what they have to trade. Alright, nothing too special here. The herbal medicine would be nice to have though. It costs 18 silver though, and like I said, we have nothing to exchange it with, so uh, we'll sadly have to pass. In the meantime though, we can quickly lay down the plants for research bench, stool, table and crafting spot. And if we put them down in this formation, then the stool in the middle can be used for crafting spot, table and research bench at the same time. So we only need one stool to serve three purposes. Shortly after, Cambia once again heads off to bed, and while he's asleep we get our second event, some crashed cargo pods. These drop a good amount of hops which can be used to brew beer, not that we necessarily want to do that, but they might also be useful for trading. So Cambia will haul them back to the base once he's awake again, we just need to slightly increase the size of our stockpile for him to be able to do that. Now we also want to tell him to roof over the stockpile, otherwise the items outside will slowly deteriorate. Alright, so our visitors are leaving again now, and just a few seconds later we hear a noise coming from the north. The group has apparently run into the polar bear, and as we can see here, the polar bear lost the fight. This is now extremely convenient for us because it secures us a large amount of food for the next few days. Contrary to the snow hares, the polar bear can serve us for multiple meals, and so even though we didn't up trading anything, the group of visitors still proved to be useful in the end. Now Cambiar has already eaten the last snow hare and built a roof over the stockpile, and he is now building a research bench. In the next episode we will very likely start using that, right now though he can quickly haul the polar bear back to the stockpile, and then also start bringing in the hops. 
After his second hauling tour, Cambiar has earned himself a quick polar bear snack before he can then head out one last time to grab the remaining hops. He wasn't quite able to carry all of it, so 10 are still left up here, but we won't bother coming back for those. The time it takes to get up here can be better spent elsewhere. And with 195 hops in our stockpile, Cambiar can once again head off to bed. Now at this point I quickly realized that I ordered Cambia to build a wooden stool and table. That of course will not work without wood, so here we'll tell him to build the steel versions instead. And despite Cambia being tired, we will quickly rush him to build those two things. Afterwards he can then go to bed and get some well-earned sleep. And we have our shelter up and running and ready for big plans in the next episode. Now, I hope you enjoyed this episode and the mix of challenge and, well, somewhat educational gameplay. I am definitely eager to continue this series. And of course, if you have any questions or ideas for it, then please leave them down below in the comments. If you liked the episode, then I'd be happy if you could leave it a thumbs up. And if you want to support the channel, then feel free to subscribe by clicking on the small trophy icon in the middle of the screen. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.